Um, so first of all, who's seen a talk from me before? Lots of you. OK, cool. So some of you know who I am. Um, we're going to see if this clicker works. Um, I know it works if I make noises. So do ignore the fact that I might be going pew every time I go forward a slide. Um, so this is a story about a system that I've been working on for a while uh, called ExoBrain. And um, ExoBrain sort of started off as a sort of just a name I'd given to it. And eventually it grew into something that was real. And um, fundamentally, this is a story about love. Because I love lots and lots of things. Um, like many of you here, um, I love freedom. I love Daniel's hair as well. Your hair is looking amazing today. Um, so I love, I love freedom. Um, I'm very, very big on open source and freedom. I'm very, very big on coding. I love coding. Um, my students, I, I teach programming professionally. My students don't understand when I say, I go home and I code for fun. That's what I do to relax. And um, I love other things as well. Um, so last year, I discovered that I really love dance dance simulation. And you might be wondering, what's Dance Dance Simulation? Um, it's like Dance Dance Revolution, but you're on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a picture of me um, finishing uh, my final set on the Dance Dance Simulation machine at Burning Man. Um, I managed to intentionally throw my combo at just the right time, so in the very last arrow, it would actually immolate me in my victory pose. Um, so I was very happy with that. And as far as I know, I got the highest score on the machine for the year. So thank you. <laughs> I also love to track things. And this is how all this ridiculous stuff that I'm going to show you started. Um, so I go swing dancing. Um, and there's dance lessons like every Wednesday. And what I discover is that every Wednesday I go, oh, I know I should go to dance lessons, but I just need to fix this bug or I just need to do this thing. And I'd always find a reason not to go. So I don't know if there's any B-Mighty users in the audience at all. Um, there might be a couple. I started uh, tracking my dance lessons. I started tracking when am I going to dance lessons. And of course, to automate that, I would need to write bots, which would then check my phone's location to see, are you in the right spot at the right time? And so I end up with these beautiful graphs of my dance lessons. Um, I would love to graph things like, you know, what's my inbox size? Um, these are things to try and encourage my inbox size to go downwards. Um, this one's a little bit old, but you'll notice that it works because it starts off at 1,200. And like down here, it's less than 1,200. Um, <laughs> it's, it's still around that level. It hasn't actually got much below 200, but it's there. And I also do things like I track my mood in various ways as well. And um, part of that, so I can get insights about, OK, I have been sad. Are there things which have been making me sad? Or I've been feeling really good. Are there things which have been making me feel really good? Part of what I love to do um, is to track what I've done each day. And I found this beautiful service. One of my old housemates recommended this. Hi, Claudine, if you're watching. Um, this wonderful service called I Done This. And um, what they were is this fabulous little startup. And they had this brilliant idea of you just record what you've done each day. So it's like, hey, I went to Open Source Bridge. I did this thing, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, whatever it is that I've done, uh, finishing bugs, you know, life achievements, things which didn't go too well. Um, so you could record all of this. And then what I loved about their service, it would email you back a year later with what you were doing on that day. And so I would get, or if it didn't have a year's worth of data, it would be six months' worth of data, or three months' worth of data, or a month, or a week, or whatever. So every day, you'd get a, hey, here is what you were doing a year ago. And um, that was actually really cool. Um, I found it was very cyclical. So I would say, what am I doing today? It's like I'm crying into my slides, because I have to finish them for my talk. And then sure enough, a year later, I'd be crying into my slides. And this email would arrive saying, you were crying into your slides a year ago. Um, so I've now actually got this set up. So it tells me what I was doing a year ago plus one week. So what I would be doing next week, this time in the past. And then when it's like, you're going to be crying into slides, it's like, oh, oh, I can prepare for that. And um, that's actually much better. <laughs> so I actually found this. I thought it was awesome. I loved this. I raved about this. I told all my friends about it. And then they did like something which may have happened to you in the past with some of your services. They switched it off. They switched off not the bit where you could record what you had done, but they switched off the thing that would send you an email of here's what you were doing a year ago. And I'm like, I could have a text file where I just record what I've done each day. I don't need your service. I was using your service because it had this wonderful thing. And of course, I was so upset because here is this service that they'd given me totally for free with no advertising. And like I'd been using it. And then they went and switched off something which I love. So I was outraged. I did 
what any concerned, upstanding citizen of the internet would do, I wrote them a very stern email. <laughs> and they apologized. They actually said, look, we're really sorry with this, this small little startup. And um, the, sending out the email requires lots and lots of resources. There's a lot of hassle associated with it. It's a monumental pain in the ass for us. And it's not, it's not actually what makes us our money. And they're like, we're really sorry. We would love to do this, but we can't justify it anymore. So they apologized, but they said no. And so I had to take actions into my own hands. So I went to the website. Um, I fired up Firebug, which is a great little sort of debugging tool and everything. And I sort of pieced apart how everything on their website was working. And based upon that, I, I asked them, do you have an API? And they're like, oh, no, we're planning to. So I wrote them an API, um, which was essentially just you know, scraping all these JSON calls and everything. Um, and then because I don't like using a web browser, I wrote a command line client so that you could do everything without ever visiting their website. And then, because I was worried if they've turned off one thing, they might turn off more things. So I wrote them a data export tool <laughs> so you could get all your data out of that. And then, of course, what I really wanted was to implement all those dropped features so you could have it like email you back, here's what you were doing a year ago. And then I released that as open source software. And then I wrote to them and said, surprise! <laughs> <laughs> I've done this thing for you. You've got an API now, and people can move away from your platform, and they can do all this stuff that you took away from them. Aren't you happy? And I was half expecting this. <laughs> but that's not what happened. They actually said, oh my god, that's so cool. Can we do an interview? So I was like, yeah, OK. And they actually contacted me and said, like, which endpoints are you using? Because we don't want to break your software. We actually want to make sure. It's really cool. They're like, we will leave those endpoints in place even if we stop using them, because we want your software to work. So it had a really happy ending. Um, and I think that's because the people that I've done this are insanely cool. Um, but that's not always the case. Um, there are situations where you have a service that you deeply love. It's out there on the, the wild internet. And it dies for whatever reason. So, I don't know, does anyone here, did anyone used to have a GeoCities homepage? <laughs> yeah! So I had a GeoCities homepage. It was super cool. It was still under construction. <laughs> <laughs> but GeoCities closed down everywhere but Japan. GeoCities in Japan is a special and magical place. You should definitely go there. <laughs> but GeoCities, unfortunately, is no more. And I was very, very sad. So things do die. Things get re-featured. It's like, hey, we've got this thing that you love. We've changed it to make well, any time a company says, we've made it better for you. I'm like, oh, no, I liked it how it was before. Things get re-featured. Um, the license can change. There's this terrifying thing where you say, you know, here is this website. I'm like, hey, we can like give you notice that we're going to change the license. And if you continue to use the service, you've accepted those changes. And you might not be happy with those changes. Um, admittedly, I don't know if anyone here has seen Tumblr's process for updating uh, terms of service. There was one for a time. First of all, all the, the terms of service are up on GitHub. Secondly, when they update them, you can look at the diffs. And some of the diffs are just things like, you know, don't do this. And the change is, you total jerk. And it's like, that's a really amusing change to put in your license terms. But these things can change. There is, in fact, a website here. I think I've got Amber in the audience. Hi, Amber. There is this, hi. Um, there is this great website called IndieWebCamp.com. Um, there is, in fact, a section on there for site deaths. And it tracks parts of the internet, sites that have died in various capacities. Either they've been permanently mothballed, or they've you know, gone the way of geocities, or whatever else. Um, there is also, if you go out there, um, I found, <laughs> yeah, the Google Graveyard. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's seen the Google Graveyard, but this is actually interactive. So, <laughs> so the, the flowers there, you can click on, on, a, on a tombstone, and it leaves a flower for that service. And it, it only shows like the last 10,000 flowers or something. But the fact that this exists is sort of a real sign that you know, these things will die. And the moment I hear Google has purchased such and such, I'm like, oh no, not again. Um, because things closed down. Um, Jaiku disappeared. Um, if anyone was a user of Doppler, Doppler's like being completely mothballed. Um, there's lots of things out there which pretty much they may still maybe exist, but they're not really you know, alive anymore. So I don't want this to be a sign of, hey, you shouldn't use services on the internet, um, because the internet is a magical place. Um, and the services on there are really just, they're amazing. They make your life wonderful. Um, but I want you to embrace your data. 
And this is really, really what this talk is about. I want you to be embracing your data. I want your data to be yours. I want you to have control over it. I want it to do the things that you want to do. I want to make sure that like, if something falls over, if Facebook disappears, you're like, hey, I've still got my data there. And if you're totally creepy, I've got all my friends' data as well. <laughs> so, which is terrifyingly easy. It is really terrifyingly easy. So, this might be a hard task, but if you're a developer, I know there are some developers in this room, um, I found that software development coding is the closest thing I've ever found to magic. <laughs> and, and whenever I show my friends stuff, they like agree with me, like, whoa, you can do this thing, that's incredible. And because I write in Perl, they don't understand what the incantations mean. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it really is magic. So I'm hoping that we can shape our experiences. So I want to draw an analogy first, and I'll, I'll hop into code. Um, has anyone here used if this and that? Yeah, okay, so if this and that, if is this awesome thing, it's this great connector, you can say, when this thing happens over here, I want to do something else. So when there's a new comic, please email it to me. When I change my profile picture on this website, change it on the other ones. When somebody mentions a picture of their cat, send it to my phone, whatever it happens to be that you find important, um, you can do that with ift. And the problem with ift is twofold. First of all, you know, it, it runs in the cloud, that's okay. Uh, it's out there, it's not on your machine, but it's out there on someone else's machine. And in order for it to operate, it requires all of your data. So you have to say, oh, I need you to like, you know, check my email for things, here's my login credentials. Oh, I need you to do stuff on Facebook, here is my log here's my auth credentials there. I need you to do this in here. You end up giving this like all of your credentials for absolutely everything, they own your data. And I really think that should be something which remains private between me and the NSA. <laughs> So I started, these are real. These are real friggin' like patches that the intelligence agencies come up with. That was on a satellite, NROL 39. That was on a satellite, like the cephalopod eating the earth. <laughs> I am not making this up. So like these are real patches that you see. So I wrote my own tools. And um, if any of you have seen me like tweeting about or talking about this thing called Exobrain, um, that's sort of the framework that I've been working with. It's, it's on GitHub, so like if you want to get totally distracted by your laptop and not listen to the rest of the talk, you can do so now. <laughs> so what is Exobrain? What's one of the fundamental things about Exobrain? Abstraction. The whole idea of me using Exobrain is like, oh my goodness me, there's like 16 million different forms of social media. I do not want to have to write specific things for every single one. And so um, one of the ideas is that I can say, okay, all of these services can be abstracted away into a generic, this is a social media service. And it has things like, you know, what, is, uh, what does it come with tags? Is this directed to me? Who posted this? So on and so forth. And I'll talk about how that works in a second. The other idea about this is that it's designed to be a pluggable framework. So you do not have to, this is essentially a bunch of agents running around, you don't have to turn them all off because you've changed one of them or you don't have to turn them all off because you want to plug a new one into the network and everything. This is very much designed to be a thing where you can add and remove services as required. Now, for those of you familiar with message frameworks, it uses 0MQ underneath. Um, that was mainly because it was the first thing I picked up and because I know the maintainers of some of the bindings of that. So it's like, yeah, I know if there's any problems, um, I can go, Maki-san, sumimasen, I need help with this, and you know, he'll probably help me, fingers crossed. So the idea is you can connect, disconnect as well. You can easily restart this. You can easily patch things. You can plug th new things in. This is really, really useful with uh, debugging. Uh, the idea is that you can go, OK, something's going wrong here. I can patch something into the bus, and I can see what's going on there. That's the other thing which I should have a slide for. Everything runs on a bus. So all of the communication between the various agents, there is this common bus where it's like, hey, here's what I've found, or here's what I'm doing. You can sort of peek in on that and see what's going on. So. You might want to play with Exobrain. We'll get to like, what you can do with it in a second. So you might want to say, great, I want to play with Exobrain. How do I install it? This is unfortunately one of those hard things. I'll give you like a, I'll draw you like a little elephant stamp or a star or something if you manage to get it installed. Um, not because it's necessarily hard to install, but it's got a lot of dependencies. <laughs> and <laughs> this is a lot better than what it used to be. It used to be like, I remember one of my friends managed to install it on a Raspberry Pi, and he said, you know where he said, go and order a pizza and then eat the pizza? He's like, you should go in a pub crawl and come back, and then maybe it will be finished installing. So there are quite a few dependencies. This is definitely getting better. Um, the other warning with all of this, of course, is it's still under construction. 
Um, so there are bits which are still working, bits which are not working quite as well. Um, it's really fun to do code archaeology on the project because you can see like this is the original bits of code which have been written, which are awful, and like here are the newer agents which use the new frameworks and they're beautiful. But there's installation instructions online as well. So the fundamental way to get this installed, um, as I mentioned, uh, it's written in Perl. You don't necessarily have to use Perl to be playing with this. Um, but to install it, you just say cpanm exobrain. Uh, cpanm is an installer. And it goes, great, I grab everything for you. It installs it on your system. And then you do the setup command. And the setup command says, OK, what do you have installed? Uh, let's make sure your directories are in place, blah, 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 so on and so forth. The idea of Exobrain is that you can have this sort of generalized framework. So it gives you a way for agents to talk to each other. It gives you a way to manage those agents. They get restarted if they fall over. They back off if they seem to be having too many problems talking to a service. Um, the actual agents themselves, the services themselves, um, you install separately. And they all live inside this Exobrain namespace. So Exobrain Twitter is like everything to do with Twitter. There's like Exobrain Foursquare. There's Exobrain Facebook. There's Exobrain blah, 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 blah. The idea is you only need to grab the ones you need. Um, the original Exobrain distribution tried to give you everything. That was a problem. Also, this is one of my like-to-haves. I would love to have the entire thing as a Docker container. Because then I can just go, here is this Docker container. Please you know, type in these commands, which do all the setup for you. And you don't have to worry about how anything works underneath. If you happen to be like a, a Docker, you don't even have to be a Docker expert. If you're like a Docker person, come and grab me. I would love your assistance in setting this up. Um, because that would just be wonderful. This gives me a really easy way to distribute things. Has anyone here used Docker before? I don't know if you're, if I'm going, oh, wow, OK. Docker's freaking cool. Um, I don't want to talk about it here, but it's freaking cool. So <clears throat> let's do an example. What does the Exobrain framework let you do? Let's write a hello world. So Exobrain framework, this is what it looks like if you're writing code. This is a sort of coding talk. Um, you say use Exobrain. This is a Perl program. You use Exobrain. It loads the whole framework in. It gives you all that stuff with strict and warnings and blah, blah, blah. If you're a Perl program or all the stuff you want to turn on, they're turned on. Um, we make ourselves a, an Exobrain object, uh, which gives me access to the framework. And then I can say, hey, let's do a notify. The notify is actually really, really cool because when I do a notify there, it says, I want to say hello world, but I'm not specifying what that should do in precise terms. It just means that my owner, my user, should get this hello world message. So what happened when I did that? Um, well, it instantiated an exobrain object. It raised this notification. It auto-connected to the router. There is a, a router process that everything uses to communicate. That's essentially uh, everything working on that bus. It connects to that automatically to say, oh, I need to be here. And it sends the notification. It just broadcasts out, hey, the user needs to know this. Where the cool part is is the second part. And that is that we have these agents, these handlers, which handle notifications. So you can say, I want notifications to be sent by Twitter. So for a long time, I had this little bot on Twitter that was sending me messages. Or I want it sent via SMS. Or I want it sent via Pushover, which is a, a messaging framework for like mobile devices. Or I want to send an email, or all of these other sorts of things. And in fact, um, what I haven't shown you here, notifications can have things like priority levels. So the high priority stuff, you know, it may come out via SMS, or I might use a Twilio shim to call me up and say, hey, Paul, I'm going to tell you this. And the low priority things, they might be bulked up into email or something. Um, what I've been doing a lot of with this, I have a, um, a Pebble Watch, which you can see here. Um, I have lots and lots of things going to my Pebble Watch. So I will have things where um, I will like plug in my backup drive, and my machine will automatically realize that's what's going on. It needs to be doing a backup right now. It'll send me a message to say, hey, backup is going to start in 60 seconds. I can you know, go off cycling and everything. I'll get a note when my backup is finished. Um, and that's really cool, because I don't really want to be moving my, uh, my laptop around while the backup's going on. Uh, I was chatting to Sarah Sharp early today when I was raving about that I was using ButterFS on my USB drives. And she's like, oh, don't let your USB drives disconnect if you're using Butter. And I'm like, oh, OK. So I'm making very sure that uh, I'm not moving my laptop while I'm doing my backups. So that's kind of cool. What's happening under the hood? So under the hood, there's this thing called 0MQ. I don't know if anyone here has used 0MQ. Um, as a, there are lots and lots of uh, message frameworks out there. There's things like Rabbit, there's Zero, there's a whole bunch of other ones. Um, they abstract away the whole problems of like saying, OK, I need to connect to this socket, and I need to make sure that works. I need to send these packets out, and I need to make sure they get out to these things, and so on and so forth. It abstracts all of that away, which is really, really, really lovely. It makes it much, much easier to write these sorts of services in a reliable fashion. So it uses this under the hood. As an end programmer, you won't need to know this. 
Um, but it uses these five frame packets when it pushes things around. Why is this very well defined? Because I don't want this to be restricted to a single language. There is no reason why, if you're using this sort of exobrain framework for passing messages between agents, that those agents should be written in Perl. I really want them to be written in whatever language you're most comfortable with, and that's particularly important because there are some great libraries out there you know, that are written in JavaScript or Ruby or Python or whatever else. I definitely want to make use of those. So the five-part bracket, um, everything starts with a 0MQ header, which is used by 0MQ itself. Um, there's metadata, which is related to the actual packet. That's things like, where did this come from? What is the date stamp on this? Um, what is the class of this? So on and so forth. The packets actually have strong typing. Um, the idea is that I can say, this is a notification packet, and you know how to unpack that. Or this is a measurement packet from a social network, you know how to unpack that. Field number three is always a human readable summary. That is absolutely required by the protocol, which means if anything starts going wrong, you can plug in and you can see what's going on as a human. And then there's like the data payload, which is effectively the cooked version, and the raw packet, uh, if you include it, is essentially, here's what I got off my service. So if you received a, um, an information, like a tweet from Twitter, you can just dump the whole thing in there if you want to. That's mostly for debugging, but it's really useful for debugging. Everything in there is encapsulated with JSON. Um, because hopefully everything can read JSON quite happily, JavaScript object notation. The idea is, again, that it's easy for people to work with. The services are con controlled with this thing called Ubic. Now, you might not have encountered Ubic before. It's yet another process management framework. Um, the way in which it works is I can say, OK, I've got like this tree of different services and everything. And uh, with the original ExoBrain framework, we had sources, we had classifiers, and we had syncs. Um, that's actually been inverted essentially now. So you now have exobrain.twitter is everything that deals with Twitter. And exobrain.bminder is everything which deals with bminder. Um, the reason we've sort of changed that is to make it easier for you to have these distinct uh, uh, installs which you can have of I'm installing my Twitter components. And I should note, when you install your Twitter components, it walks you through the whole process of how do I authenticate my exobrain process to Twitter. And of course, all of this is running on your machine. Um, it could be running on your laptop. It could be running on your server. You could have provisioned a machine out in the cloud, which is what I've done to be running all of this for you. And the easy thing to know is you can start absolutely everything with one single command, and it will start everything for you. Or you can just start, you know, here are my services to do with Twitter. So this is sort of the overview of the framework. Let's look at cool stuff we can do with it. So writing <laughs> agents. <laughs> um, Agents are sort of the, the basis of everything which I'm doing here. Was that your coffee? Oh, that's my coffee. OK. Yeah. I, just, I just put my stirrer in it. So, so you can now enjoy a small taste of my coffee. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. You can make it up to me by reminding me of your GitHub account. Uh, PJF. PJF. Yes, yes. So writing agents, um, this is fundamentally what we want to be doing. I want to have an agent which does stuff. So agents are classes um, in the framework. And the way in which we set up a class in Perl is this funny keyword called package. And um, everything starts with you know, exobrain agent and then whatever we want to call it. So I'm going to write a ping agent. This is one of my favorite agents, and I'll show you why in a sec. We use the exobrain framework. And if you're a Perl programmer, there's this thing called Moose, which is like the most awesome object-oriented framework that's ever existed. I want to be using that as well. Why? Because it allows me to consume this role, exobrain agent run. This is an agent which is just going to run. It's going to sit there on the bus continuously, listening for things to occur. The other type of agent which you can have is a polling agent. And a polling agent gets woken up on a regular basis to do something. And that's useful for things where you don't have like a continuous stream interface. It's like I have to wake up and then say, hey, has anything happened in the last minute? And that sort of thing. Um, with a running agent, in fact, with any sort of agent, we have a, a method, which is here is the actual method which is going to do the work. Um, if you're a Perl programmer and saying, hey, what is that method framework or that method keyword there? Um, it actually is provided by Exobrain and it actually comes from method signatures. I'm not going to get too much into that there, but it makes your life wonderful. So what's the code actually look like? Um, well, the fundamental way that most agents are written is by having this watch loop. So you can say, OK, I want to navigate to my exobrain sort of uh, controller. I want to set up a watch loop. And I say, I want to look, watch for packets of this type. So whenever I see a measurement social going across the bus, I want to do something. 
Now, with ExoBrain, there are two fundamentally different types of packets. One is a measurement, and a measurement is anything which is like, hey, here's an external piece of data that I've managed to find. Um, so it might be something like a tweet, it might be the size of your inbox, it might be the current temperature, um, it might be the ping time to whatever thing you're monitoring, whatever that happens to be, those are all measurements. Um, the other thing which I'll show you later on are intents. And intents are I want to change the world in some way. I want to send a message, I want to post something to Twitter, whatever else. So this is essentially I've read something from the world. So if I see a measurement social, um, then I can have this filter, make sure it matches some filter which I want, and then I can say I'm going to do these things, whatever these uh, the, the actions are from that. The idea of the filter is that I can make sure this is a packet I'm interested in. So um, I get back my event as my first argument. Um, I can get a list of tags. Um, so if it's Twitter, for example, those would be hashtags. And then I can make sure that this event is to me. Now, this is actually a method which is provided by that measurement social class. So anything which happens on social networks, anything which happens on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever other social networks you've plugged in here, it's either to you or it's not to you. This is a binary value. So if somebody's written at PJF in a tweet, it's to me. And if they haven't written at PJF, it's not to me. Now, this is actually decided by whatever is reading those things off. So if it's something which is posted to my wall, it's to me. If it's something which is a comment which contains my name, it's to me. But if it's you know, something else which doesn't contain my name, it doesn't. This is essentially decided um, by whatever is reading out these, uh, these bits of data. So make sure it's to me. And then I'm going to say, make sure that that list of tags contains a ping tag. It can contain other tags as well, but just make sure there's a ping tag in there. So that's essentially my way of making sure that this is something which is sent to me and also contains ping. I have my bots watch everyone's Twitter streams because there might be interesting things on there. This person has posted something with a hashtag that I care about. I'm going to add that to my pocket database, those sorts of things. Um, this is making sure that stuff is specifically written to me. And then, and this is my favorite part of like the entire talk, and doesn't look that exciting, then, <laughs> then I respond with ACK. So, and in fact, because it's Perl, you can do that as well. But why is this so exciting to me? Why is this so enormously so exciting to me? This, either of these versions, does a respond by saying, I want to respond to this measurement with an ACK packet, but that is platform agnostic. So if you happen to be a packet that came in via Twitter, it acts on Twitter. If this happens to come in via Instagram, it acts on Instagram. If this happens to come in via Indie Webcamp's shared Mindspace 2.0, it does that. So this is this wonderful thing. It's like I want to respond in this way, but I don't care about the details of the social network itself. So if you do this, and this is the point where my watch usually starts buzzing, if you were to send an at ping to me or a hash ping to me on Twitter, you would actually get back an ACK from my, my network using this respond thing. So how does that respond work underneath? What it does is it generates an intent response. An intent is I intend to change the world in some way, in this case by responding to this packet, and that goes to a response agent, which then gets tweeted, and as I mentioned, that's platform agnostic. So that I really, really like. The big feature, as far as I'm concerned, of all of this is the fact that we have this abstraction. Now, when something I should actually men mention, when we had a, a, um, a measurement social before, there is no such thing as a generic measurement social packet. It's always a measurement social Twitter or measurement social Facebook or measurement social something else. It's always from a particular framework, but they all adhere to this measurement social standard. So they're always going to have, give me a list of tags. They're always going to have, is this to me? They're always going to have, here is a way that you can respond to them, which is really, really nifty. So let's look at those message classes a little bit more. Let's say that I want to write something which reads information from a particular source. Um, let's say I want something which samples my inbox sizes. Um, so this is, I apologize for the, the really long uh, class names. Here we've got a class name, Exobrain Measurement Mailbox. This is for measuring any sort of mailbox. It does not have to be email. So this could be something like, do I have extra messages on my favorite social network, or do I have extra messages somewhere else? So this is for measuring any sort of mailbox. And again, it uses ExoBrain and Moose, and it adheres to this thing called ExoBrain Message. What does that do give me when I adhere to that? It gives me this awesome thing called a payload keyword. 
And a payload keyword says that this is something which my class must provide. So when I create an object, the object must have all the things which are in the payload. And when I transmit that across the bus, all of these are going to be serialized. So the idea is that you can have sort of, you know, these nice little attributes, which is just helper attributes, but then you have things which are actually going to be serialized. And they can have strong typing and so on and so forth. These are all just strings. Everything has to, has, a, has, has to have a summary, of course. And in this case, I say, to provide a summary, you need to call this build summary method. And the build summary method simply says, I join all these things together. That uh, the user at this server with this mailbox has this number of messages. And so if I was to read that off the bus in human readable form, I would see that message. And I could immediately know what my sample is. So that's how I would write myself a, um, oops, that's how I'd write myself a measurement packet uh, for me measuring things. And you might be wondering now, okay, so Paul has this generalized framework for sort of working with systems. What does it support? And the answer is it supports all the stuff that I like. <laughs> So, so I use Twitter quite a lot. I use IMAP quite a lot. Um, Pushover is what I'm using for actually getting these things to my watch. That's not open source, but it's like the best $2 I've ever spent on an app. Um, Facebook, remember the milk, Foursquare, Beeminder, blah, 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 Habit RPG, so on and so forth. One of the important things is that ExoBrain will talk to Beeminder. For those of you who have used Beeminder, Beeminder, yay! Beeminder lets you, Beeminder in a nutshell, you can graph things and then you can have these bots which threaten you if you like aren't doing what you say you're gonna be doing. So I say I'm gonna floss my teeth like every second day and I will have my phone pester me every second day to say, Paul, you need to floss your teeth. You need to floss, you haven't flossed your teeth yet. If you don't floss your teeth by not, I'm gonna charge you five bucks. And that's what actually got me to go to dance lessons. The whole thing of like, if you don't go to dance lessons today, you're losing $15. Dance lessons are $15. I'm going to lose the money anyway. I might as well go. And that sort of had me go to dance lessons every week for a year. So Beeminder is awesome. But Beeminder also connects to a bunch of things. And Beeminder will call back to ExoBrain to say, hey, I've read this piece of information. Here you go. And so half the information, possibly more than half the information that ends up in the ExoBrain framework actually comes in via Beeminder. And so this is really, really nifty. There's all this other stuff. Whenever the Beeminder people like add things to Beeminder, I get that for free, which makes me super, super happy. So what things have I done with this? And these are all sort of in the repositories. You can download them all. Um, one thing I use this for is to do management. Now, I'm actually in the process of transitioning uh, uh, how I do my to-do lists and everything. Um, so this is a little bit out of date. It still works, but I'm using a system which is even more geeky than what I was using before. And um, the big thing which I wanted, and I know this sounds weird, the big thing that I wanted is I wanted to let other people add to my to-do list. Why would I ever want that? Because I end up at these conferences and someone's like, Paul, can you send me this thing? And it will be while I'm like working on my slides for the talk I'm just about to give or I'm running to catch a bus or whatever. And now I can say, yes, I can totally do that. Send me a tweet with a hash to do tag. And so if you do this, really useful at conferences, you can say, hey, to do this, uh, the colors might be a little bit off with this screen. And my exobrain, or now my main account, will respond with, thanks, I've added your to-do item, and it will give you this receipt. So it will say that I've absolutely, that's now in Paul's to-do list. Um, or if things are broken, it'll say, hey, I've, I've had problems with that right now. So this is really, really nifty. You can add things to my to-do list. Before you get too excited about this, um, two things, three things. First of all, it goes into a separate queue. So it's not going to be showing up in my main to-do list. It will show up in essentially this inbox from the internet. <laughs> and you'd be amazed at some of the stuff that ends up in there. No, Due to, <laughs> no, you wouldn't. <laughs> Due to some of the, um, do you know some of the things that my friends would like me to do? Um, there are now filters on there for Rick Astley videos. <laughs> And also XKCD jokes as well. So make me a sandwich <laughs> is not going to end up in my to-do list. Uh, you'll get a snarky comment back from one of my bots. <laughs> so this is really nifty. Um, other things which I use it for. Habit RPG. Anyone here used Habit RPG? Yes. Okay. Habit RPG turns your life into a cheesy 8-bit video game. 
And, um, and in fact, this morning at the keynote talk and everything, this is essentially what I was thinking about because it's like, oh my goodness, you can get like experience points for helping other people, uh, you know, realize, like get over their imposter syndrome and, and then you can level up in helping other people and that would be great and you can buy a new sword. So anyway, this is, this is Habit RPG. Um, I love Habit RPG, but I hate using the web. Um, so I wrote a bunch of interfaces for that and a command line client. There's a command line client, HRPG stuff. And it's, okay, the command line client's really cool because you can do things like HRPG space plus space whatever, thank you, um, plus whatever, and it will go, oh, you've written like floss. I know that means floss your teeth and it will do the appropriate thing and it will come back and stuff and so on and so forth. So anyway, I maintain a bunch of bindings for this and a command line. Um, what this means is that I'll be like, hey, I'm working on some stuff. I'm doing some code and everything, quite possibly on Exobrain itself. Um, I commit things, that goes to GitHub. Um, GitHub gets regularly scraped by Bminder to update my git commit graph. Bminder then calls Elf to Exobrain uh, to say, hey, there's new information there from GitHub. Um, Exobrain goes, hey, you've been making git commits. That's great. It gives me experience points and gold on Habit RPG. Um, and then what happens is because the whole world needs to know about this, this thing goes to Twitter to say <laughs> congratulations. And you end up with this, congratulations, you gained seven experience points and 0.9 gold pieces for responding to email. <laughs> Or you gained this much here for doing it. Whenever I floss my teeth, I get, I kid you not, a notification on my watch telling me how many experience points I've got in tooth flossing on my watch. And I get combo bonuses. If I floss my teeth every day, I get combo bonuses for flossing it every day. So, yes. No, it does. Well, this doesn't have a sound. This doesn't have sound. We could program an awesome noise. Um, I haven't done that yet, but like, ding. Du, 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 du. Yes, <laughs> that, would be, that would be wonderful. We're just about to get to question time because I've been told I've got 10 minutes left, so this is all beautifully timed. Um, working features, this is the sort of stuff which I already have working. Um, XP rewards for email because I suck at responding to email. So whenever it sees that I've actually responded to what looks like a person, this gives me that. To do tasks from Twitter, I actually want to update this to do to do tasks from email as well. Um, and to do tasks from social media in general. Because very often what I want to do is send it someone an email was like, here's a list of things I need to do for you. That's in a really easy to see format. There's a bunch of dot points there and everything. I could just put a little header, have that drop directly into my to-do list. Likewise, if I'm on uh, some sort of social media, Facebook for example, and I want to be you know, reading a, an article someone's posted, I don't want to have to like manually press a button on a web browser to do that. I just want to like write a comment or something, like you know, hash read or hash to do to get that into my framework. So that's still something I'm working on, but to-do task from Twitter absolutely works. Some of you might have been doing that during this talk. Um, updating my Beamminder graphs for like everything, uh, XP for git commits, running, flossing, so on and so forth. Um, I've started playing the zombie run game. I don't know if anyone's played that. Yeah, so the reason my legs are so sore is that I was chased by zombies last night. Um, they actually have really easy APIs to scrape. Like the, the whole thing of scraping out your information is really easy. So I'd like to have that set up as well. Um, logging locations and everything, I will like, you know, go to my favorite cafe and I'll check into Foursquare with a hash office tag. I'll get experience points for uh, going to my office. Um, but that will also get logged in my personal journal if I was there today. And of course, you know, the typical much, much more. So where can you find out more about this? Uh, GitHub.com slash PJS slash Exobrain uh, is the place to go to. I will be around for the entire conference. So if you find that there are any sort of stumbling blocks there, and there may be some, you can ask me for help. But what I hope this is going to give you is a way that you can go forth and use your data for good. <laughs> You're welcome. Everyone, thank you very much. <laughs>
Right now, I have to go to the Beeminder application on my phone, and I press a button to say I've lost my teeth. Um, what would be super, super cool is, I don't know if anyone here has used Tasker. Um, Tasker, it's, a, it's an app for Android phones. I'm not, a, 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 not familiar with other platforms. Um, but it's an app for Android phones. And you can do something where you can say, when I see this near field communication ID, trigger these things. And what I would actually love is like a little uh, near field communication button where I keep my, my floss. And so what I can do is I can pick up my floss, put my phone there, floss my teeth, and have it pick up that it's sitting on the button where it's the flossing button and like do the right thing. Um, I don't have that working yet. So right now, that's yeah. manual entry yet. <laughs> Most things are fully automatic. And that's one of the big points of this is anything that requires me to manually enter something is I had to manually enter my inbox size. No, never going to do that. Having a bot that updates my inbox size means that when I'm you know, too busy to clean my inbox, I'll have something saying, hey, Paul, you need to be looking at your inbox right now. It's getting a bit large. So unfortunately, flossing is still manual. Denise. Um, that would be really easy. Um, there would be, you'd probably have a pair of bots, one for talking on IRC and one for reading IRC, and they could actually be housed in the same thing, so you wouldn't get, yeah, absolutely. If you want to get together with me, that would be wonderful. Um, Friday's a really good day for that because it's the unconference, um, but as of tomorrow afternoon, all of my conference duties are done, so you can grab me and we'll, okay, after you've finished your slides, we can work on this together. Excellent. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's wonderful. Um, have you thought about getting the same use from it? Uh, it sounds like you're kind of anti it, but pro Beeminder. Well, the nice thing about Beeminder is a lot of the stuff that it picks up is publicly available information. So for things like my Duolingo lessons, you go to Duolingo slash PJF, and it tells you how many points I've got or how long my streak is. That doesn't require me to give it any sort of authentication stuff. So for things like what's my inbox size on Gmail, no, I, I love Danny and Bethany very much, but I don't want to give them my authentication details for that. So I actually like Beeminder because it's oh yeah, I like Beeminder because it's able to pick things up without needing authentication. Okay. Um, so I'm not I'm not anti if this and that. I'm just I'm sort of touchy with who I'm sharing my data with is more the case. Oh, I should also mention before we all run away, um, if you're interested in stuff like this, there is a wonderful framework called Huggins, and Huggins does exactly what Beeminder does, but in a totally different way. And um, it doesn't have quite the same level of like strongly, types, uh, uh, strongly set types and everything. It has some really cool classification things. So you can say, when there's an abnormally large number of such and such, more than two standard deviations away from the mean of this, I want you to do something. So it has these really cool classification features. So I, I would absolutely make sure that you check that out as well. But back to questions. Yes. Um, my ferocious housemate <laughs> is my hope as to what does it. If they break into my apartment, I've got my laptop here. If they want to steal my stuff, they steal my stuff. It's, I'm not too worried. I've, I've got too much stuff anyway, so I'm not too worried about that. <laughs> yes? Uh, so I mentioned in the lunch line a little bit. Uh, yes. I, I work on the source uh, data archival. Yes. Archival yes. Uh, and uh, so this is a real-time message bus primarily. Yes. And, and the perfect thing would be to say, every time I see me do something online, I'm going to archive that into the magical, what was your name again, Eric? Eric. Eric's magical archive system. So that would be perfect. Um, the, the trouble, though, is mm -hmm. that um, this archival system is already doing archival. So awesome. I, so I'm that sounds like a feature. Yeah, integration can happen. Um, could go one way or another. Absolutely, absolutely. If you already have stuff which is like automatically archiving things, then that makes my life easier because I can just, oh, sorry, microphone. I can just like pull stuff out of the archive. I can just sit there and watch the archive. Yeah. And yeah. I, I really like the message bus architecture mm -hmm. uh, that makes it really easy to write pages. And I think that that's something that Hamlet's book may be uh, Excellent. So we should have a chat. Yes. Yes. Uh, pull requests are beautiful. Um, if you want to write your own separate module, you can go and write your own separate module. Um, if you're like, hey, I'm writing this thing to work with such and such, which is like not in the ecosystem already, then you would like start your own module and everything and run with that. Um, but if it's like, hey, Paul, and I get this, like, hey, Paul, you've got a bug here. 
or like, your logging framework sucks, let me fix that for you. Hi, Leon, if you're watching, um, I get wonderful requests on things like that. And it's like, great, that's awesome, so I go with that. Um, so pull requests are fantastic, but if you want to like, you know, add a new service, that service doesn't exist. That would probably be a, what we've been doing is separate repositories for each service, because um, that means that people can easily say, I want to install just this one and just this one and just this one, and I'm not using all the, all the other things. Yes? Oh, that would be Ubik. So Ubik is doing the management there. Um, and uh, Ubik probably has a way that you can say, make sure these ones are running and make sure these ones are not running. Um, I haven't yet added something where the agents themselves can say, I'm not supposed to be running. Um, but Ubik's doing most of that right now. And if you find you need something more sort of configurable than that, let me know. We can figure out how to do it. I think with that, we've oh, no. Oh, no. OK. Everyone, thank you all very much. I'll be hanging around the whole conference. You are wonderful people. I would love to chat to you more. Thank you.